Great. So I think it's time. So I'm going to get started so we can go off early. So it's better to be early, not to be late. Yes. So hi, everybody. I'm Christina Lin. Um, just to do a little bit of introduction to, about myself. Um, so in my morning day job is I am a technical marketing manager. So what a technical marketing manager does is um, you know how we have each have a product. So my job is to put lipstick on the pig to make the product makes pretty and good. So that's presentable in front of you. So that's my day job. But um, that's fun. But as a technical person, I feel I my passion is more like uh, more on evangelizing the technical content. So for me, I really like to share what I've learned throughout the years of what I've been doing and things I've seen in the customer side. So this is kind of a summarized view or a summarized thing I've seen in the past few years um, on the top of cloud native application where people are doing it and some things are some, sometimes they're doing things wrong, sometimes they're doing things right and just a summarized uh, view of what I've seen before and then just uh, so there's not going to be a lot of demos here today, but a lot of um, concepts on how to put things together and how everything works together, right? So that would be something, um, that would be the the whole agenda of this uh, this talk. So cloud native, so what is, so to set the base of what cloud native is, basically we're just, we're talking about all this application that's running on top of all the public, private, and hybrid clouds. And then we want to make them scalable. We want them to make them flexible. So these are our goals. We want to make sure that their speed, they can, they, we have speed, uh, fast speed to actually get them onto production. We have quick access and we can scale them. So flexibility and scalability is something we're looking for. And um, so the problem is for most of my customers uh, or people that have been using our Red Hat technology uh, or people that's been using other technology, they always got bombarded with all this terminology from cloud native world. Like, okay, what's this microservices? Okay, I've learned microservices. So what is this new service mesh thing coming up? And what is that, uh, like, what is it that event sourcing that you talk about when you do like the eventing, the event-driven architecture? And what is this automation CI CD that you're talking about? And all this thing gets into their heads, but they don't know which to put what. And so here I am, I, I just wanted to make things straight, just to actually put things in a more organized way and to make it easy for uh, people to understand what they are. So I call this 700 BC, that's 700 days before container, right? So that's kind of what I put it. So before containers, uh, I was doing a lot of application um, developments and application integration. Integration. I was more on the integration side of the story. So I was doing applications and the application needs to talk to each other and and you know, I, when I was doing it, I was I had this Excel file which contains all the application that my application talks to. And whenever my bosses or my bosses, you know, they ask me like, who do you talk to? I would bring up this Excel file and start reading out to them. Like, so these are the application I'm talking to, and that makes things really chaotic because it's really hard to manage and you know to to actually make. Uh, if I need to make a change, I need to not notify all the three parties and all that. It makes things very complicated. So that's why uh, we started this all SOAR and ESP thing, right? So I have this uh, big centralized um, enterprise service bus, and it's moving things apart, and it's moving things along, and then I have to find the big services, right? That's good. Um, but then while I was doing the SOAR stuff, I found that I became the bottleneck of the whole uh, the whole company because they were waiting for me to implement the integration te the technology. So that's when I started to think about, you know, if I can break down my integration code into smaller bits and pieces and deploy them independently, wouldn't that be better? So that's when I started to um, start to do like lightweight ESB. And then that's when I got into the OSGI world um, because before everything was on Java, the big Java EE container where everything is in a big monolithic application. And then uh, we kind of started to look at OSGI. So OSGI is this um, Java, it's also, also running on just this Java virtual machine, but where you can isolate it, um, modules, right? So you can put them into bundles. So when you wanted to restart one of the um, one of the applications, it doesn't affect the other. So you don't have to restart everything. So which is creating a much lighter weight and modulized things, uh, which is better, right? But then it comes along where it kind of started the whole cloud native, you know, container world, 
where now people are switching switching to microservices. So that was a big thing to us because we are kind of going on the same way, but we haven't got it yet because we haven't figured out what's the best way of deploying our technology, what's the best way of you know automating it. Because we're kind of like still trying to figure everything out. But then this all um, whole cloud world has come along, and then we kind of we saw like, oh, this is the way we should go, and this is the way we should put everything together. This is how we should develop applications. So that's kind of how this is. So this is what the um, CNCF, the um, the, the uh, community of the, uh, the Cloud Native Community Foundation. This is how they define what a uh, reference architecture should be look, look like. So you kind of see this is where you kind of uh, this is where you kind of do your application development. This is where you can orchestrate all your stuff together, like container orchestrations, storage, and then um, provisioning. That's the CI/CD automation stuff, right? So these are the things that define what should be in the architecture, right? But this is all very vague. What do you mean by that, right? So for me, then I drew this diagram here. That makes more sense to me. I hope that makes more sense to you, right? So well, I'm going to explain a little, a little bit. It's, it's a, a little bit small, but you're going to get the slides anyway. I'm going to tweet it so you guys, you guys would have the slides. But for me, I wanted to break it down into bits and pieces. And I want to show you um, so that it would be easier for you to understand how to build a, a better cloud-native um, reference architecture or architecture, right? So I broke it down into four different plans, right? So the bottom plan is the uh, orchestration and platform, where it handles like uh, most of the container, container orchestration. It, it contains all the basic and foundations of how things work together. And then we have the top, the top part, which is, which is uh, where we're going to focus more, more on our topic today, is how to develop your application on a container. A cloud native world or container native world, right? So this is how uh, how so this is how everything should be done, and then you see event events coming in, in inside this plan, and then you also um, see microservices here, and you see the data sources here, and then you also have the service mesh plan where it handles a lot of the um, controlling of the traffics of your your application where the where the traffic goes, right? So this is the this is the traffic control plan, right? So it's controlling where everything goes and you know that and then this is the resource opt optimization plan which is or how do I optimize my resource how do I make sure that I'm shutting my service down when it's not being used so sometimes people call that serverless but I think serverless is more than that right service serverless is not just resource optimization serverless is is it, you still have to think about functions and who has been defining functions? Well, Lambda has been defining functions, but nobody else has been defining functions. So we still on our way to define what the functions are. So I wouldn't call it serverless. Well, it's partially serverless, right? But I think that's kind of uh, a, a resource opt optimization plan right now. For so that's kind of um, how I view this whole architecture and how they how it, it, it's been put together. And then we've also got this um, you know technology that's related to the uh, two different plans, right? So for um, data you have change data capture, data integration, how do I put data together? And then we also like for microservices we have the domain driven design, right? All that kind of stuff. So that's kind of my view. So that's the that's the overview of today. So you've seen this we're done. Okay, but I'm gonna go to into the details of um, what they mean and what I mean by them and how you do them, right? So kind of just go going deeper into what's going on, right? So first of all, microservices. I think you've seen this like a hundred times, so I'm not gonna talk to you about, talk to you about microservices anymore. But basically. Breaking down your monolithic, monolithic into microservices is good. But for me, the struggle is, what is the size of your microservices? And why do I need to decide the size of my microservices, right? Should I break my microservices into two in a row? I put two, two different things in the microservices or three different things in the microservices, right? I, how do I decide what they are? How, how, how they should be, right? So the whole, I think we should take a lot of cautions when we are defining microservices and domains because that that totally, um, when we make that decision, 
we have to think about how we're going to deploy it, right? Do I deploy two different functions in the services in an instance, or how are, they two, how are these two communicate together? So, and that would also affect how we do automations, right? Because how you deploy it is related to how you do automations. So when you're defining your um, your domains and things in the microservices, you have to think about it. Like, think about, um, is this an independent piece of code that would be independently talking to each other, right? So some of the big mistakes that I see people when they're doing um, uh, domain-driven uh, design wrong is they have this huge big services, right, in the middle, which is very similar to what we have back in the SOA day where all the services talking to this one, and they become the bottleneck. And then you should think about how do you break it down, right? Are you putting too much task into the services? Is, can we make it a can we can we separate those two and make it uh, more distributed communication in between in between those two? So um, things in here with microservices that I see you should you know think about reiterate. Um, and sometimes uh, with bounded context, another thing with microservices which is the bounded context. So you would have you know two different you know domains that's talking to each other. And sometimes when I see what people does different uh, it does a little bit uh, wrong is when they would define a payment here. And they think, okay, pay payment is, is what's, what's in this domain. So wh whenever I need a payment, I'm coming back to this domain and then trying to access that here. But you have to think about it. When, when you talk about domain, do you mean, uh, when you talk about payments, do you mean payment in the shopping cart domain or do you mean by the payment in the insurance domain? Because sometimes they're very different and they should handle differently. So, you know, um, and so that's, that's, I see a lot of like inter-domain communications, it's way too many. So um, that's when you should redefine your bounded context again, right? So some things that I see a lot of people doing uh, a little bit wrong here, or not wrong, but like, I think they should um, refactor a little bit. But the good thing is, like you know, for microservices, it's really easy to refactor, right? Think, um, so the other thing um, I was talking about a little bit um, before is um, communication in between domains, right? So I have people asking me, um, so if I have microservices here and I have microservices here and they, def they, def uh, they belong to different domains, um, how do they talk to each other, right? So it's always clear that between domains you should set um, a set of contracts or boundaries. So for this this particular microservices wants to access a particular services here, they have to go all the way out and then come back to the services. They shouldn't do any direct communications because then you're breaking down that boundaries. So then you're not doing the domain right, right? So um, the way that we're setting up the contracts is because we know um, these would be probably be two different teams working together, and whenever there's more uh, a secret passage between the domains, that's not always a good thing because then you have leaks and you know too many dependencies between each other. So it's always good to go through contracts, and you know, and then we, when we go down to the next part, you'll know why I have all these different colors for my microservices. But um, for now, it's just like for microservices, make sure you do your uh, domain-driven architecture, uh, domain-driven design, and set up your bond, uh, bonded context right. And okay, so now we have all our microservices created. We have defined our domains. It's all done. It's great. It's small. It's fast. It's simple and easy to maintain. Um, now the problem comes. I have. Um, about 300 different microservices, and they all need to talk to each other. Awesome. And the better thing is I have other services trying to use my microservices. So in order for this particular function that needs to be get something done, he needs to call 300 different microservices to get it done. Awesome. And it, it creates a great service mesh, and they're trying to talk to each other. And then I have to, I have to get out my... Uh, my uh, Excel sheet again, and then starting to write down who's connecting to what, and telling my um, my boss, and oh, I've got like 300 different microservices connecting to my services. That's awesome, right? That's not a good way of doing things. Um, so that's why I came up with this HR integration concept. So this is not this is not something that you done physically, but logically, right? So you have to think about the responsibility in your microservices, right? So. 
you have, I define it into uh, top different um, responsibilities. So here, this is like normal microservices where you do every single day, like single business logic with its own data source, right? Each microservice should have its own data source. That was defined. Um, so you've got all this doing it here, but what about these? So these are the controllers, the, um, the microservices that you know helps you to put things together to hide the complexity from others trying to call your application so from from um, calling your services and also helping you do some transformation of um, data because we know not everyone wants to use Java not everyone wants to use Python sometimes people like Node.js and sometimes um, their data um, format would look a little bit different, so somebody has to come in and normalize it sometimes. And so this is what this layer does. And what about this one? So this one, I call it the uh, more like a, a uh, facade for um, everybody. So this one would be more related to people that's calling you, right? So say, for instance, Netflix is giving a services to PS4, iPhone, and then maybe a your Samsung TV, right? The format of data, the, the, the data itself is exactly the same, but the way they give out data would be a little bit different because um, PS4 wants um, XML with some extra metadata, and then iPads wants, you know, your iPhone wants JSON with other data, with your data with other in JSON format, and maybe the, your Samsung TV wants a plain text. Who knows, right? They have they requested the same thing but with a different format and they want to change all the time. And then you have to deal with all these changes. And this is the facade, um, this is the facade where you do all that kind of stuff. So I see this one will be updated more often than the core business and the integration. And this one would be more like, you know, updating it for quick changes. So that's how you get your system more agile. That's how you get them more, uh, more free, more flexible. Right, so the core, so basically the core is just um, built and then and run it, right? Basically that's just that. They have um, like uh, data source connecting to it and then you should have the runtime as easy. And, and then we have the, um, the, the control and dispatch, which is the facade, which helps you to deal with all the different needs from different customers, right, and different users, and then make it easy and faster for them, right? And there, um, there's two different kinds of inputs, right? The first one is the, um, the, the request and response. So you sometimes you would have um, like a request and response and giving that back to them, and sometimes you'll be just receiving um, a bunch of uh, streaming of data. So that's kind of what we see today from the um, control and dispatch. So you have to be equipped and be able to receive all this, um, all this kind of st uh, stuff. And so, in order, okay, so coming back to this. So in order for us to actually create a better way of communication between your vendors, your partners, we have to set up contracts. And what's the best way of set up contracts today? APIs, of course, because there's a standard API um, doc documentations where you can configure it. It's called Swagger, right? Used to call Swagger. Now it's open API standard. Um, so there's. So now, how do we how do we define the APIs? So the old way of doing it, like how I used to know, is I am a developer. I'm gonna go ahead and start my business uh, dis development, and once I've finished my code, I am going to. Um, tell the other guy, which is talking to me, and says, "This is my contract. This is what I'm going to do. You stick with what I what I tell you to do." Which is kind of more like a whistle, right? Remember the old SOA days where you have whistle, they give you whistle, and then you kind of uh, load the whistle, and they will generate the code for you, so you have the code ready. But now, what people do today, and you can see that in my YouTube video, I have, I have a YouTube video that shows you how to do um, API first. So there are tools that can help you to actually ta uh, create contracts. So you can build your Swagger document without any coding. So all you need to do is just configure what are the URL I want to expect. This is the, the this is the data format, and then it's going to generate this Swagger document for you. And whatever you do is just you take that Swagger documents. 
and then give that to the developer and says, this is the contract I just set up with the, um, the partners and just go, go ahead and implement it, right? So that's gonna save you a lot of back and forth time between your partners and um, developers. So now it's, it's, it's more like the more adopted way of doing things right now, which is API first um, development. And then this is why I more see more is like when you have the bounding context, I see more code first because that's how people used to like to do work. But with the external users, you have seen more like a contract first development. And then once you have the APIs, of course you need to uh, secure it. I don't want to go to deep details into API management because it's a, a big, another big topic I can talk in three hours, right? So you have to talk about how do I secure my APIs and how do I manage them, all that. But just remember, when you have your contracts, make sure you have a way to manage all these contracts. It's like a, like a place where you can put your file and then where you're, um, when the people want to see what the contracts are, they get to see it, right? So it's just like that kind of management for your API contracts. You need to do that too. And then we have the composite um, re responsibility where in the middle, right, remember? Uh, remember that layer thing um, that we have? So that's that, where you're gonna have um, a lot of um, service orchestration, um, transformation of your data, you know, or collecting the data. Sometimes the data comes in, in streams. You wanna collect them and then give that back to the uh, big data storage or you want to split them up into um, microservices because now it's more scalable, so I want to split them up and then send them all, all over different places, or you want to normalize the data because they're coming out from different devices. I want to normalize it and send it back to the back end. So this is what this responsibilities, uh, this layer is supposed to do in the, in the responsibilities. And then talking to external services. And last but not least, anti-corruption. What do I mean by anti-corruption? So all the application that we create today, right now, in the cloud native world is greenfield. Like it's all new, it's all um, the new shiny content. But then you still have to talk to all these big IBM machines where, oops, I don't know, all these big machines. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, they're very slow sometimes. Um, and then, um, you know, because their cycles are longer. So you can't really wait for three months to deploy your application. It's not how you do things. Um, in the Greenfield application. You want to do like, you know, every two days, every hours, I want to like publish my code. So what does this help you to do? Actually, you can create a, a middle, middle tier where it hides away so you, you can implement a lot of things in between you and the legacy application. So it hides away all the complexity. So whenever there's an update that you need, it will help you to transfer, transform whatever you need and then put it into a more easier way to communicate with your legacy system. So that's anti-corruption layer where you're supposed to do. So that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so that's the, what's, that's the responsibility. So, and then, that's all the API talks and all that. But then we have events. So this is the diagram that I created. So these two diagrams are supposed to compare next to each other. Um, so there's two ways of communication, asynchronous communication and synchronous communication. API are synchronous communication, where you have a request and response, right? So the way you do communication is a little bit different when you talk about a, a synchronous communication, where when a request comes in, it always um, expect a response to go out, right? And the way you actually call, you, uh, you wait, the way you actually calling, you're, you're triggering all the other services, mostly sequential, right? So I'm calling this one and then I got my response, I'm calling, and I'm calling this one and this one. So it's mostly sequential. And the way you can synchronous, okay, so just to, be, uh, just to set the background, we're doing it in a distributed environment. This is no more, you know, all this monolithic internal, you know, memory calls and all that. No, this is all distributed. So the communication between microservices are important, right? So this, so this is the way that synchronous um, communication does, right? So in, if you, so think about this, all this data, they are all independent data source. So if I want to sync up, if I want to do a um, data sync between those two, say they all have um, data inventory information. So if I need to automate, if I need to update all this, I need to make two API calls to make it sync. 
right? And the way that to set up contracts in um, a APIs or synchronous call is I can do it with open APIs. Uh, the swagger stuff I just uh, talked about, right? So you can do that, and then all this call can be monitored and managed through API management um, toolings and stuff like that. And then when you talk about transactions, right? Transactions are super important because before we have XA transactions, you know, all these transactions. But now with distributed environments, we don't do, we, we want to avoid transactions, but sometimes it's not avoidable, right? So what do we do? Well, there's a patterns where we can implement it's called Saga. So the way it does is you can do like compensations. Um, I have a slide that shows you later on. That shows you, you know, because it has every services would have a compensation. And then if something goes wrong, it's going to call that compensation. Basically, is that if you're, if you're taking $1,000 out, the compensation will, will say add $1,000 back, right? That kind of thing. So if um, the service is calling service two, service two is calling service three, and then something is wrong with service four, it's going to come back and tell service three, run your compensation. And then it's going to come back and tell service one says, run your compensation. And then um, the service one will then run it like that. So that's the saga pattern where you can do, that's how you roll back a transaction, right? So basically that's what you have. Um, so with a synchronous call, you'd kind of do that. But in a distributed world, making everything synchronous, maybe it's not a good idea because it's a lot of time waiting, right? And because everything is scalable, you can actually, it's a better way of doing things, I'm pretty sure. So that be, that's, that's why event-driven architecture had become so popular in the distributed world. Um, so instead of you know data coming in as a single request, well, you still have those command type of res like request and response coming in, but then you can have um, states of streams, streams of states coming in as well from those IoT devices, and then you can collect them in the buffer, in the in the buffer, and then send it through your microservices. And then is instead of creating this like service mesh uh, contacting one to the other, everything will be sent into this um, in this uh, centralized store or or dispatch of your events. Well, then people will listen to your events, and if they want to hear your events, they will react upon your events. So you're creating a more reactive system, right? So that's kind of how you do it, and and then that's so in in the in the front you have um, a, a buffer buffering uh, place where you can store. Or events coming in and then in your bundle context right you would have something that's there and to and to have that contract you know how contract is very important between systems right so for APIs it's uh, for for restful so for uh, synchronous services or synchronous call it's the APIs that's setting the contracts but for for a synchronous cause, it's the data is your contract. The data is your contract. You set, you t you you tell the next person that this is our contract and this will be it. So there's no, I think there there are works and their community they're working on creating a synchronous API, but I haven't really seen a lot of effort on that yet. I've seen some people are doing it, but I haven't seen a really strong community. But I'm I, I think uh, in a couple of months there will be one that will be more dominant in the market, and that will be your asynchronous API calls. But now, all I see right now with people, how people do it is they have the data as the contract. And then we have um, transactions. So how do we do transactions in a, um, in a event driven or uh, in a cloud native world is that people do event sourcing. So um, instead of um, like a real time transaction rollback, we do eventually rollback. We do eventually consistency of the data, right? So when when people put in there, they would um, and people list, will listen to the state of this person and then updating it. If something goes wrong, they would add another say uh, instead of. Um, minus 100 and then take out that minus 100, they would just say uh, uh, plus 100, you know, minus 100 and then plus 100 just to uh, balance it out on the event source. Basically, you have a store where it kind of stores all the states. So instead of canceling the state, you add a, a compensation on top of your states. So it's very similar to Saga, but it's in, it's in a way of storing, storing things, right? And then the other way of synchronizing your um, data is change data capture, right? So 
the way that they do it. So instead of, um, you know, this services calls every single microservices and synchronize this call. No, um, this one will any changes to or any changes to this serv uh, this data will then ha will have a mechanism listen to all the changes on this data, and then the people that's inter interested about this um, data was changed in the database will listen to that and pick it up and then update their um, update their, their, their data for inside their data store. So that's kind of what people are doing in a data synchronized, synchronized world where they do change data capture um, in, in the event-driven world. And then also, the old good old event-driven architecture, the thing is to share your states, right? The states is immutable, and uh, so it's, it's the person does not know where the where their information is going out to. He doesn't know who's listening to his states. All he needs to do is, okay, I'm giving out my states. Anybody who wants to know my states will get my state. And they can react on, on top of that. So that is the, if that's how they do that on the, if, that's how we do it in the cloud native world, right? So two things we can do, the, the synchronous way and a synchronous way, right? So different ways of implementing it depending on how you want to do it. So I've got that. So this is how kind of this is one of the top topologies that we can do. So um, and normally we have um, data, we connect database with a uh, a uh, technology called the Visium. I don't know if you heard about the Visium, uh, but we call it Kafka Connect in Red Hat. Um, so what you do is you write a code that. Um, grabs all the tables that you wanted to listen to, right? And you can kind of like do a filter, like I want only wanted to listen to expect simple SQL stuff. And then um, listen to all the changes, and this uh, code will then detect all the, so basically it's going to your um, database log, you know how they, when, whenever you do a, a select, delete, it's gonna, read, it's gonna read from that log, and it's going to write it into Kafka. So we'll have a Kafka in the middle, and then you have another similar, um, to be sure you another, another database or another system. Basically, that's how you do a change data capture, right? All right, so that's kind of like a summary of the HR integration. But that's only the first top layer of my, of my talk. And it's kind of, I, I know it's going to take a lot of time, but I think you should spend more time on developing it because the rest of the content, the rest of the stuff are built for you. They're the tools that you use, that you want to use in order to achieve all that greatness of building that architecture, right? So for the container orchestration platform, which is OpenShift or Kubernetes I'm referring to, the reason why it exists is because now we have all these beautiful microservices flying around everywhere. It creates a big headaches for your ops person because instead of having them to, um, you know, managing just ten big application server, now they have to manage like thousand different smaller microservices. So basically, what the Kubernetes and OpenShift does, it helps you to rein in your container, it helps you to manage your container so so your microservices don't go everywhere. So basically, you can do load balances, right? So any services, um, well, basically service discovery, right? So it kind of lets anybody that wants this little microservices right here, um, he uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift will then tell, okay, you're coming in here, and then you're getting it here. So it helps you with the discovery, and because of the discovery, it helps you with all the um, load balancing because you can create a diff your different microservices, scale your microservices up, and then it does all the um, load balancing for you, and you can do that with uh, the scaling because uh, it, the OpenShift will control your microservices and they'll replicate it for you. And then you can also, the biggest uh, big problem with um, all this container and this microservice is config. I have config for my production, I have config for my testing, I have config for my um, UAT environment. All, all they, have, they all have different configurations, they all have different secrets, passwords. Okay, you don't write your, your passwords in the config map, right? That's totally wrong. If you're doing that, it's you're like, no, because it's always, you know, people have access to it. So you have to find a way to secretly hide your ID and password for, uh, you know, entering your database and stuff like that. So there needs to way of, you know, managing all this. And then, you know, I have all this container, but 
what is in the container. It's the image that you need to run, right? That where's that image? So you need to create a place where you can find all the image and pull it, pulling it down. So it has a registry to store all your images. Monitoring help you to um, see what's going on in your platform. So basically, that platform helps you to um, manage all this, you know, crazy flying around containers, and that's what. Um, and also collects all the logs. So basically, that, that's what it does. It helps you manage all your um, all your uh, containers. But but that's not only that. Doing cloud native or container native. Um, uh, system. The first thing comes into mind is other than microservices doing it right is automations, because there's a lot more you need to do. So you need to do a lot more automations too. So to do that, um, cur uh, now we have a operator. Pat Has anybody heard of operator patterns? So. The operator patterns helps you to actually, um, it will spin up the operator. So this operator, what this operator would do is that it would um, help you to manage your application lifecycle, right? So um, this, when you have this operator spin up, it's gonna see, okay, so now what do we have? Um, so then you have to define, okay, this is the services I wanna stand up, or this is the image that I wanna stand up, and, and it's going to list, it's gonna take a look at all the things you have configured in your, in your application, in your OpenShift system, and then it's gonna go off, and then see, and then create all the services, and pod, and routes that's related to this particular applications. And if you make any changes or anything um, to the things that you have registered in your system, the operator would know, and then it's going to update, or patch, or do whatever, or delete. If you're going to delete that, it's going to do that. And so it's controlling the um, life cycle of your services. That's making your, uh, so having that would be, uh, would make your things a lot easier, because it's managing your application for you for a little bit. But other than uh, the whole application management, so these are just um, some of the, the CRDs, I don't wanna go into deep details. So basically, you know what OpenShift is, right? It's a big server, and it's basically the big API server. So basically, how you wanna to ask Kubernetes OpenShift to move is you call this APIs, right? And to actually use these APIs, you have to define a definition. So and so that's why the developers in Kubernetes OpenShift, they would uh, define all this, uh, all this uh, CRDs, and then when they, and when you call the CRDs, they will go off, off and then um, implement all the, you know, what you need to do with this, all these configure, uh, all these definitions, and then go off and create, create the resource against that, you know, things like that. So that's what you do. So for for uh, operators, you need to define all this, and it will spin up all that for you. So the other thing for uh, automation is pipelines. Pipelines are super important. So these are just managing. Um, all your life cycles, but this is picking it up, um, going through a process of building it, letting users see if it works, and then uh, and then promoting it to production. Today, I think we're still figuring things out because I think these are doing a little, a little bit overlapping stuff. So I think there there will be an effort of people seeing what's going on here, and then they will make two things work together. Maybe I can put a pipeline into my into my operators, and my operator will do that. Or there's a way for me to build in my operators into part of the pipelines. I'm not sure, but I think that's how the uh, the next uh, the next phase of technology would go to. Because I think we are still figuring out in the cloud native world. So that's why the people on OpenShift they have decided to create these operators, and that's how they manage the life cycle, but then you still have people that wants to go through the traditional CI, CD pipeline, right? So I think in a way that we're still trying to see how those two things work together. My question to the engineers and stuff like that is how do, you, how do we make the best advantage of, you know, this is easy for me to, uh, to, to do my life cycle, but I need to move this around into different environments, so how do I do that? So can I embed an operator into my pipeline, things like that? Um, so that's kind of what we have. And I have Jenkins in there for the pipeline, but there's also another project kicking off by, uh, with Red Hat, it's called Tecton. So basically what Tecton is, is a, a smaller way of um, allowing, to, allowing to build a application a lot faster. Um, um, it doesn't have, uh, people always associate um, Tecton with Knative, but you actually don't need Knative to spin up Tectons. Basically you're just defining uh, your pipeline in a, um, in a YAML file. 
similar to what you normally do in OpenShift, and then OpenShift will go off and kick off a pipeline for you. And there are efforts in, um, in Jenkins where they're going to build that with, with Tecton. So Jenkins will also with Tecton, but they're still doing that right now. OK. So how long do we have? We have like 10 more minutes. <laughs> I'm only halfway there. Anyway, so this is um, the next layer, which is the um, which is the uh, service mesh plan. So the service mesh, I think everybody knows about service mesh, right? So why do we need service mesh? Why 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 is SEO like people like it so much? Well, the problem is, remember this one? Like people talk about microservices and they say, yeah, I, when I created um, all these microservices, great. But people talk about how do we control these microservices? You know, if I want to talk to service A to B, how do I know they have privilege? How do I know they're okay to talk to each other, right? And what about the versioning? Um, when I have version two of these microservices, version three of these microservices, who should I talk to? You know, how do I, you know, promote all this crazy stuff? Um, that's a lot of things that we want to do. So before um, the service mesh or SDO came out, normally what we do is we have separate libraries and we will embed that into our microservices in our code. And then we define, you know, the circuit breaking, the routing and everything, the, you know, reading the, 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 the headers and then we redirect them to different places. I do that in my code, right? But that's not the best way of doing it because I want to have a centralized place of control. I want to control the timeout time. I don't want this person decided it's 10 seconds and, and then you decided 20 seconds, right? It's everywhere. No, I want to have a centralized place to control everything and then knowing where everything goes, right? So that's why um, this SDO thing came along. And instead of writing all the code, all that stuff in the code, we don't do that anymore, right? So it would spin up a sidecar proxy, MOE proxy. So it will it will run right along next to your application, right? And then um, so a centralized place um, and a beautiful GUI called Kiali. So it's the management layer of the whole SEO. And then you can configure your policy. Say um, this service to this service timeout. All this timeout time is 10 seconds. And then you have like this services would be um, to redirect into the services, and they'll do this services and the the the, um, the production you know deployment policy and all that. They can configure it here, and then all this will be um, um, redirect. Uh, sent to Sidecar, and then Sidecar can decide if they want to call the services here. And I, I want you to see this one here. So remember the, the plans that I have, right? So this is where this, the request comes in, and this is your services. Normally people in a normal application, they would just go and then call the services and the services in here. That's what you think it would do. But after you apply the service mesh or the SDO, into your system, this is where the traffic goes. So instead of going here, and then it's going down to the SDO proxy right here, and the proxy decided, okay, if I want to go this way, so this one will go here and then execute your code. Coming down here and let your proxy decided where to go. So basically, this is your logical way of you know how things move, but basically all the traffic is going from there to this way. So. That is how the um, traffic flows from each other and the sidecar becomes this gateway that helps you to redirect and decide how the policies, policies are applied on top of that. Right, so these, all the sidecar, they are the data plan of SDO, and then you have control plan where they're feeding off, um, they're feeding off the policies back to the sidecars, and then they're giving back the metrics back to your control plan, and they're gonna send it to Prometheus, and then you can do a Grafa use Grafana to make pretty pictures and stuff like that. So basically, that's it. I have a lot more slides, but. Um, that's basically just the mesh. And then we have um, the Knative. I want to talk about, a little bit about Knative. Um, I don't want to talk about Knative build because I think people are changing stuff and we have Tecton, so I want to talk a little bit about Knative. And then there's um, 
the, the biggest um, thing about Knative is the way that you can it can optimize your your resource, right? So when you know when we spin up a pod, when it's still running, it's taking up CPUs, taking up memories. Wouldn't it be best if there's no flow coming in? I would just shut down, and when the flow comes back up, I would just bring up again. So guess what is the best architecture of doing this? Event-driven, right? So basically, Knative is an event-driven architecture, right? So that's why you would have Knative eventing, where they have cloud events coming in into Knative, and they will wake up your services. And then there's something called Knative serving, and this serving will then scale it up, right? And then when there's no more traffic going in, the serving will say, okay, there's no more, there's no more event coming in, I'm shutting down myself down. So basically there's two different places. Serving helps you to bring it up and down, and then you have events to trigger it on and off, right? So basically that's the basic of serving. And that kind of concludes my architecture today. Sorry I speed up a little bit, I'm a candidate, but I can do another video on uh, YouTube. So come to subscribe, to my, subscribe to my YouTube channel, I can do a little bit more on candidate but I can do a demo on top of that. But just remember today, you went through all this, right? The platform, what's going on in the Knative world, in the cloud native world, the networking, the service mesh layer, the, Knative, the, the opt optimization of resource layer, and then this great big piece of how to build your cloud native application with all these microservices and do all that, and then synchronize data, and then how do you synchronize all this data, and then the asynchronous call and the synchronous call, doing it differently, right? So um, yeah, so thank you. I have uh, three more minutes for questions. Any questions? Oh, okay. So uh, there's tickets. The party, the tickets to the party is at the registration. So don't forget to get them from the registration, and they will be uh, limited. So don't forget to get it today. And um, if you don't get it today, I think they're holding some back tomorrow. So if you don't get it today, try it out tomorrow. That's it. Thank you.